This is Jonathan Yates with College AD. Welcome to the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We are with an interview with Mark Ingram, the athletic director, or as we call it in the industry, in the big chair. Mr. Ingram, <laughs> thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Yes, sir. Happy to. Thanks for coming down. So I was driving over here from Atlanta this morning listening to Alabama Public Radio. Your mm -hmm. stadium was approved by virtually a unanimous vote. That, how epic is that, not only for the school or the program, but the city of Birmingham? Well, it's terrific, uh, Jonathan, for... Uh, you said it, the city of Birmingham, and all of our citizens. Uh, it's a public-private partnership. There's going to be corporate dollars involved in this along with uh, various other entities. And what the city did today was approve their intent. It was a resolution of intent to move forward on the stadium. There's still the funding model that has to be fully vetted and, and considered, but uh, it obviously was a very positive step uh, in our favor. Now, speaking of positive, you've, you've had an epic month, an epic six weeks. You've had you know, first bowl game. CBS article coming out saying you guys were the, not the comeback story of the year, <laughs> but the comeback story of all time. CBS Sports not hooked Bill Clark as football coach of the year, which is yeah. very impressive when you look at what Frost did mm -hmm. at University of Central Florida. You had a great weekend with recruits, your first signing day tomorrow. And then next week you have the computer programming championship here at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Right. Now, Chris Del Conte in his press conference when he became University of Texas athletic director last month, he said, I'm an amazing crier. Yeah, he is. I cry when we win, I cry when we lose. How much have you cried over the yeah. past six weeks with all this? I'm victories? glad that you said that. You know, um, Chris and I are like minded in that regard. He and I are <laughs> friends and uh, I, I'm just, uh, I have a total love affair, my wife knows it, a total love affair with college athletics, uh, the transformational process that our student athletes go through, I'm a product of that and um, I appreciate so much everything that it's done for me and what I see in our other student athletes, I, I so appreciate the support that our fans and donors give us that it puts us in a position to provide these great opportunities, this amazing experience to these young people. and. Um, so, yeah, Chris did say that, and, and I uh, would have to concur and say the same. <laughs> now, Andrew Luck, the, uh, with the NCAA, uh, Oliver Luck, Andrew Luck's father, he made an interesting comment when football came back. Mm -hmm. He said Alabama is a better football state when the University of Alabama has football. What did he mean by that? You know, Oliver Luck uh, is an unsung hero in all this process, and he's not a guy that's, that cares that anybody knows that, but he really helped us navigate through... Uh, uh, a lot of bureaucracy and help us move quickly when we reinstated the program to get a team back on the field. Um, initially when we reinstated football I think we had about 12 players still here. They had all graduated naturally or they had transferred out and we didn't have a, an incoming class. It was over the winter months so in that February signing period we didn't sign a freshman class. So uh, the only people who remained really were the ones who were so close to a degree it only made sense to stay. Uh, and he helped us to put a team back on the field uh, at, at a quicker rate than, than has happened in the past. Now, it wasn't all luck, no pun intended. What role did you play? How did you engineer that re remarkable reversal? Well, I, I'll never take full credit for anything. Um, but our, our head coach, Bill Clark, and I uh, worked together along with our compliance staff. Uh, Corey Bray, who used to work at the NCAA office, was a huge help uh, in knowing who to call. And our conference office, Conference USA office, uh, the commissioner at the time was Britton Banowski, who's now with the College Football Playoff Foundation, and uh, he introduced us to Oliver, who, who also, again, we, we started talking, and Oliver was very clear. He said, let's, let's just get deliberate about our discussion, and uh, what do you need? I don't know if we can do any of it. I don't know if we can do all of it, but we'll do something, and let's know what you, let us know what you need. And, and so we put together a, a wish list, if you will, of these are the things that would help us get back on the field the fastest and uh, in, a, in a way that we were concerned about putting people on the field who were not physically capable of being there. Um, we could have gone out and, and probably recruited a lot of uh, young men from our campus who were already here who had played maybe in high school that would have loved to suit up, but uh, really were not prepared for the physicality of the game. And we were concerned about their health and safety if that was the direction we went into, and, and we fortunately did not have to do that. So it sounds with Oliver Luck that it was a classic case of under-promising and over-performing for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and uh, we met in Orlando at the NACTA convention, and Coach Clark went with me there, and we visited with Oliver and other people from the NCAA about uh, the process, how can we do this and make this uh, something that would be palatable to the rest of the membership, because, you know, believe me, we're not the first 
program to start football, but we are the first to restart in such a short amount of time. And so there really was not a great case precedent for us to look to who else has done this recently. And, uh, and so we knew we were in uncharted waters and knew that we were setting precedent uh, in our decision. But um, he made it very clear, Oliver did and others, that uh, this was not something that they want to be a trend. And they don't, they don't want people to feel like um, that this is the, the answer to, to solving other problems and they want to help people uh, create solutions. Now, in Sweet Home Alabama by Leonard Skinner, they sang that in, Bur in Birmingham they love the governor. Do you think now, after the new stadium goes up, it's going to be in Birmingham they love the mayor? Well, in Birmingham they do love the mayor and we're appreciative of the mayor. And um, this conversation, I think, has gone on, I heard today at the city council meeting, for 20 years. 1965 is what I read in the paper. And, and, and in fact, someone said it's been going on longer than the mayor's been alive. <laughs> and um, I don't know how much any of that is true, but what I know is... Certainly is longer than you Longer than me, alive, that's yeah, for sure. no doubt. And, uh, you know, we as a city want to come together and create an economic um, force that would allow for other important works. There's a lot of work to be done in our neighborhoods, a lot of great needs, whether it be streets or schools or neighborhood revitalization. And this is a, this will create a new funding source that does not exist today that will allow for some of those projects to actually happen. Mayor Woodfin was talking about a 300 percent return on the city's mm -hmm. commitment. He said it'll be three million in tax revenue and we're going to get 9.9 .9 million back. Do you feel you can deliver there? I think so. And, and uh, the, the BJCC, which is the Birmingham Jefferson Convention Center, they've done all the studies and provided all the data in that regard and uh, and I trust that and I trust the process that they've gone through and we've been a, a partner in that and when needed called upon we we have answered the bell and uh, and answered their questions but yeah they they provided all that economic data. Now Satchel Page the great pitcher he said anyone who knows anything is moving to the south and when you look at the cities <laughs> that are booming Raleigh, Nashville, mm -hmm. Birmingham one thing strikes out, they've got great universities. Mm -hmm. Raleigh's got NC State, Duke, Chapel Hill nearby. Yeah. Nashville's got Vanderbilt. Birmingham's got UAB. What are you doing as an athletic department to make sure that the city grows as much as possible from your presence? You, you know, UAB, this is surprising to a lot of people, even the citizens of Birmingham, UAB is the largest employer in the entire state of Alabama. Um, so what you're talking about is the largest employer inside the largest city in the state of Alabama. and. And so our growth and the strength and vi viability of this institution is critical to the success and strength of the city and, uh, and all of its citizens. So uh, we're a, a key component there. Uh, every 1,000 UAB students provides 50 million in economic impact back to the area. And that's, that's important. That's important whether you own a restaurant or a, a gift shop or whatever that might be. And, uh, and so we take great pride in that and our enrollment has grown tremendously over the last three years. We're up to almost 21,000 students, which is remarkable growth, more than uh, most people can probably say. And, um, and we're proud of that. We put a lot of things in place as an institution to make that happen. And we'd like to think that the success around athletics and football has played a key role in that. Now you speak of with the restaurants, Zagat in December said that Birmingham was one of the most exciting 30 new food cities coming in, into the country. <laughs> and in terms of the hospitals, I was reading in the paper today, the nursing program here is in one of the top 5% in the country yeah. and that the Student Entrepreneur Center is booming too. So there's a lot more to University of Alabama at Birmingham than I think people realize here at yeah. Blazer Nation. No question. Um, so UAB ranks eighth nationally in NIH funding. That's the National Institute of Health. Uh, we're pr amongst public institutions. Uh, we have a lot of nationally ranked programs uh, uh, top to bottom here at UAB. Our health professions are uh, off the charts and um, we're, uh, U.S. News and World Report ranks us in the top 200 of institutionals, uh, institutions worldwide and, uh, and that's exciting. I mean, that's, uh, we're a, a world-renowned medical research institution and, and we're proud of that and we promote that in recruiting and we promote our hospital and the children's hospital and all the great work done here at UAB and when we talk to people, parents and recruits, we talk about the health and safety of their children. I mean that's a, uh, a point I make every single time I talk to recruits and their parents is uh, we want them to have a great experience, we want them to get a wonderful degree here at UAB, but you're going to send your, pros your most precious commodity to us and we're going to take care of your child. And, uh, and that's something we take very seriously. Now, when I interviewed Heather Lake, the AD at Pitt, she said that was her favorite part of being an athletic director, yeah. 
that you know she got someone's child for four years and helped him grow it. Is that your favorite part of being the athletic director? It's certainly near the top, and maybe that is it. And watching these young people come in here from the time you recruit them to the time they they graduate, uh, I've I've been uh, heard saying many many times to recruits, I'll tell them or I'll ask them if they have any championship rings, and uh, oftentimes they have. And I'll ask them, does that mean anything to you? And they'll say, oh, it means everything to me. And a young man Saturday morning. One of our football recruits, I said, what does it mean to you? And he said, it's something nobody can ever take away. And I said, that, well, I said, I love that. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of rings that you're going to win here. I said, but there's no trophy that you'll ever be more proud of than the one you hold over your head as you walk across the straight stage at graduation. And I say that all the time. I mean it. I'm sincere. It's something that they'll carry forever, and, it, and no one will ever take it away from them. That reminds me, I was at the Knight Commission event mm -hmm. in October in D.C., and Mark Emmer, at the head of the NCAA, he talked about a study they did that showed that 75% of D1 basketball players, 50% of D2, and 24% of D3 basketball players thought they were going to make the NBA, <laughs> when in reality, less yeah. than 1% will make it. Sure. When do you think that light bulb goes off in an athlete's head that, hey, you know, I'm at UAB, one of the best schools in the country, great restaurants, great entrepreneurship center, fantastic health and tech. You know, I'm going to focus on, you know, not just staying for a BA, but getting my master's in five years, too. When, when does a proverbial light bulb go off? Then? You know, I think that that dream of playing at the next level is a good thing. I think it helps drive them sometimes to practice harder and work harder, not just to get on the, if you're talking about basketball, get on the court and get in the rotation and get minutes on the court. Uh, but even the last person on the bench, they believe they have an opportunity to play somewhere professionally. And I think that's that's a healthy goal to continue to, to chase and, and believe in. I, I don't have any issue with that. I, I think everyone goes to college to become a professional something and if that's something that they want to do, more power to them. And in the meantime, they're going to get a wonderful degree in doing it. You have great women's sports too. What's the impact of Title IX been here at UAB? Oh, I think that uh, uh, you, you, know, you have to understand what Title IX is and, and most people don't. Uh, you know, it's an educational amendment to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, it says that no person will be discriminated against at an educational institution that receives federal funding, uh, which is United States Code Section 20. Uh, in 1994, Illinois Congresswoman Curtis Collins introduced the Equity and Athletics Diversity Act. And now on an annual basis, we, report, uh, we produce a report called the EADA Report that shows the effect of Title IX on college athletics. We report roster sizes, scholarship dollars, uh, budgets, these sort of things. And uh, I feel like we've made great strides here in trying to, to make sure that our young women have a tremendous experience and, and we have a great plan in place to, to create equity in the areas maybe that we were deficient. Uh, we did a Title IX review uh, as soon as I got here. In fact, there was one that had already been started that I completed and that helped provide great clarity on the pathway that we needed to take to get ourselves in a position to, to really support these young women. Now, when I was out at the University of Wyoming interviewing the AD there, Tom Berman, I was talking to a female golfer. And I asked her what her handicap was. She said she was a scratch handicap. I said, what about your dad? She said, you know, he plays to a 13, 14. I said, well, do you ever cut the old man a break when you play? Let him use the short tees and you tee off in the long tees? She said, no. She, she gave me a look like, you know, I might give him an occasional <laughs> mull again. But right. No, I mean, do you see that same level of competition from the female athletes in the classroom that you see on the golf course? Oh, the absolutely. Ball? Absolutely. Our, our young women are high-achieving students, and they're high-achieving on the field and on the court. I, you know, our, our women's soccer team went from 11th to 3rd this past year. Our women's basketball is currently ranked first in the conference. I mean, we're, we're very proud of the work that they're doing, and they're as competitive as anybody. And uh, I would echo what that golfer said. I play basketball in the driveway with my children, and I'm blocking their shots if I can. <laughs> I, there's no, there's so the no slack the, being cut father here. Of the year I'm not getting it. I'm not getting it. Not for my kids, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so next question. I, I, I was driving out here, and I did some research, and you know, Vincent Van Gogh, he said, you know, great things come from a lot of little things together. Yeah. So I checked out your Twitter station for your fuel station. Okay. Hashtag Blazer Fuel. I'm uh -huh. now 628th follower. Thank you so much. So, I mean, what's the, fuel, what's the uh, fuel station like here? Yeah, we added a nutrition station for our Olympic sport athletes. We built one uh, at the football office. So when we built our new football operations center, uh, we were able to design one into that facility, which has been tremendous. If you talk to our strength coaches and our trainers, uh, the ability to get calories in these young people that come in, they work out, you know, you're, you're putting them through these uh, exhausting workouts and then you, know, you need to make sure that they're getting, whether it's uh, electrolytes or water or 
protein. You need to get that in their body, and it, it allows us to do that and, and help educate them on what makes their body go, what makes the engine go. And we added one. Uh, we have an Olympic sports weight room, and we added one there too. So it's it's been a great a great addition to all of our teams. Now, UAB does a great job of turning out scholar athletes, female athletes, Olympic athletes. Would you be able to do all that if you had to pay athletes? Well, you know, I guess uh, to 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 get clarity from your question, I, I would say we already do pay them. Mm -hmm. You know, the the college degree that they receive and and what that what that return is lifelong. You know, I think it's. Mm -hmm maybe short-sighted to look at uh, college athletics and say, okay, if it's, you know, it's $25,000 a year and you go for four years, that's $100,000. Is that all that your degree is worth? And I can tell you mine's worth a lot more than that and, and has been my entire life. And so, um, yeah, it would be very difficult to maintain. Uh, we have 18 sports and 450 student athletes. It'd be difficult to maintain that if, if there was a different model. And have you ever known anyone to turn down a full boat to a D1 school because of fears of being exploited, indentured, or because they're not getting paid? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, if that's happened, I'm unfamiliar with that. No other AD know. I've interviewed has ever been, been aware <laughs> of Probably not. So yeah. you, you played football at Tennessee. So Bobby yeah. Hebert, who was the, uh, the commentator, played in the NFL. He said, mm -hmm. I'm a lot smarter at 35 than I yeah. was at 25. Well, what have you learned over the years since you were playing for the Volunteers? Y you know, I think... Um, what we work on here, we, we actually have a program in place where we, uh, we have a mentoring program for our freshmen uh, to help introduce them into not just college life, but into our department. Uh, we have a very, very well represented SAC group, the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. Um, uh, they're, they're very engaged and we have different members of our athletic staff go to their meetings on a monthly basis to talk about what they do. The purpose is, and to answer your question, I, I remember when I finished at Tennessee, I knew our trainers, I knew our equipment managers, and I knew our coaches. Everything else that was happening, and there was a lot going on, I didn't know how everyone else, this whole army of people, what they were doing to help support me. You know, I knew the academics folks, but I didn't realize how many people were there trying to help me be successful. And, and so we're trying to help educate them. I, I think that's a common issue uh, nationally. People just don't, the student athletes uh, are just not in a position to really know how the department runs. So what have you learned walking your way up the college sports administration ladder? What, what do you know now as the AD you didn't realize and, you know, when you were at Georgia, Missouri, or the other places oh my goodness. working your way up? Well, you, you know, there's a process to everything you learn about uh, institutions. Every institution, no matter where they are, they all have challenges. There's no perfect place. Um, you know, if you can find a president, an administration that's supportive, and we have that here, you can do a lot of great things. Uh, I've seen good. I've seen less than good. Um, and, and been through plenty of challenging uh, moments, but uh, I think listening, you know, I've learned to be a better listener, uh, whether that's my whole life has been in development, fundraising, uh, I've become a better listener to our donors, a better listener to our fans, a better listener to our staff and our, our student athletes, and, and I'd, I'd say that's probably the area that I've grown the most. You, know, th you talk about your development background. Most people don't realize that, you know, over 50% of college students, non-athletes, put down that, you know, facilities, athletic facilities are very important in their mm -hmm. selection yeah, isn't that funny? Of, of a college without questioning the new stadium. Have you seen that here with your students here, with using the new recreational facilities that you've oh, financed? Absolutely, and, you know, the interest level that we have mostly on Alabama students uh, who are, are interested in playing football, when they come here, what they see in the, the investment we've made in our football operations center is we've given them a reason to stay. You know, they always wanted to be here, the great city, great school great weather, things that we don't control in athletics, we don't control any of those things, but we've now provided a facility that says to them they can go to that next level, they have all the training tools they could possibly ever want, it's not second to anyone, we're not losing anyone anymore because of our facility. In the past, we did not give them a reason to stay here. From an athletic perspective, we weren't giving them enough reasons to stay here and we don't have that issue anymore. You know, one thing a lot of people don't look at in terms of the value of a college scholarship is what I call these soft dollars. Mm -hmm. And one of the important things is you look at the value of the coaching. Mm -hmm. you know, if you were to just do a, a straight division thing, you know, at the University of Alabama, each athlete, each football player gets $200,000 worth of coaching. You played for Tennessee. What was the value of coaching that you received as a student athlete? You know, well, monetarily, uh, I, I've not ever tried to figure that out, but, you know, leadership and teamwork and what it means to to be a part of an organization and how, how do you how do you manage around you the your peers and the people that you know as a student athlete think about 
you walk onto the team, you know, the seniors that are there and that dynamic, and as you grow through the years, you matriculate uh, towards the, your degree, you know, the incoming freshmen, um, you've got people from all over the country, different uh, backgrounds and how they were raised in parts of the country and uh, different demographics. I mean, it's a, it's a great learning experience. And, and college itself is about learning and not just in the classroom. You learn so much uh, just being in the dorms and being around other people. Um, you learn to respect other people in a way that maybe you did not before. And uh, those are things that you can't learn anywhere else. Did you feel that playing for the great coaches you did at Tennessee, that that helped you in your career in college sports administration? Well, I'm certainly proud to say that I, I played for not one but two Hall of Fame coaches in Johnny Majors and Philip Fulmer, and uh, I take pride in that. These were two people that had a great amount of influence in my life, and uh, Coach Fulmer, who I was with for four years, he's the person who gave me the chance to play and gave me a chance to, uh, uh, and then gave me an opportunity to, to have a full athletic scholarship. And, and I worked for him when I finished playing. I was a graduate assistant in football operations, uh, sat right outside of his office. And, and uh, he's a really, really smart guy. Uh, he's, I used to tell people, he's the kind of guy who's watching film and he was writing notes and he was on the phone at the same time. And I don't know how you do that, <laughs> you know, but he was doing all those things at once. And, and uh, yeah, he had a great ability to manage his time and do a lot of things all at the same time. And, you know, seven balls in the air and, and uh, different than anybody I've ever known really. And, um, but yeah, watching them, and all the great coaches around them. David Cutcliffe, who's now the head coach at Duke, he was our offensive coordinator. Uh, Randy Sanders, who just became the head coach at East Tennessee State, he was our, our running backs coach. Uh, uh, Lovey Smith, who was the head coach of the Chicago Bears uh, and now at uh, Illinois, um, he was our, our defensive backs coach. You know, I had the good fortune of being around a lot of good people. Doug Marone, who's the head coach of the Jaguars, uh, he was the tight ends coach. And so, um, you know, this is a, a group of people who were great leaders and have gone on to do wonderful things. And you learn a little bit from everybody, right? You learn a little bit from everybody, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Uh, maybe it's the things that you wouldn't do, right, if you had that opportunity. But, uh, yeah, I was very fortunate. Do you think you would have been as successful in college sports administration if you had not had such great coaches at Tennessee? Probably not. Uh, again, that, that experience as a student athlete is what led to my interest in college athletics. I mean, I was a, a sports fan. I liked sports. And, you hear a lot of people say, oh, I just love sports, I want to work in sports, but it was really um, my time as a student athlete and watching my teammates who, who maybe would not have had an opportunity to go to college at all had it not been for college athletics. And they, uh, they may not be the next CEO of Microsoft, but they got a college degree. Through all the support that we put around them, all the people that we put in place, uh, learning specialists and tutors and things like that that we helped teach them how to study, helped teach them how to manage their time. Those sort of things that were skills that maybe they did not come to college with and they were able to graduate and now they have a chance. You know, we all want to, we're all ambitious. We all want nice things. We all want to provide for our families and those people have a chance to do that now and it's because of the extraordinary talents that they had physically uh, to play that game. And, and uh, I'm proud of that. And there, there may be people that are naysayers or aren't as proud, but it's something that I think is very special. College sports administration is definitely booming as a career. How often do students come up to your office and ask you, you know, how do I get to be, a, how do, what do I have to do to become an athletic director? How do I end up in the big chair? So I mentioned our SAC meetings mm -hmm. um, that uh, we meet every couple of weeks or every two weeks, every other Monday. I go to every third meeting and I have what I call open mic night and, and they can ask me anything they want to ask. It's a question answer opportunity. They can ask me, you know, and they've asked me, you know, where did you meet your wife and where do you buy your clothes and how much do you make? And they asked me all these things. Oh, I mean, you know, look, it's public record, well, who cares, you know? And, um, but I, I, I'll answer anything that they have. And from those meetings though, and from those interactions, I frequently have somebody, hey, can I come see you? I'd love to know more about, like really know more about what you do and how did you get into this? And uh, I've had a lot of help. You know, anybody in this industry has had a lot of help. I'm, I'm no different there. And so I'm, Anybody that wants to talk about those things, I open up my door to them, whether they're student athletes or not. But uh, yeah, I have young men and young women come by all the time. Have you noticed more and more females asking you about how do I become a college AD? I don't know that I would say more, but I have them. Um, it'd be hard for me to measure, uh, is it more or less? But, but I certainly have young women ask those questions too. And I think that's great. You know, the diversity in our industry has grown so much in the time that I've been in it. Uh, if, I, if I just took a snapshot of what the NACTA convention and the uh, NAD, NACMA conventions that happen in the summer. If you took a snapshot of that 20 years ago and 
and versus today, um, there are, oh my, I, I don't even know, 10 times, 20 times more women than there were then. And, um, Many of the recent hires, yeah. Dr. Carla Williams at UVA, yeah, Dr. Chinese, she's awesome. Judah Wyatt. Awesome. Awesome. I know them both, and I used to work with Dr. Williams at Virginia, and I know uh, China Jude as well, and these are these are great role models to anybody that, that's interested. Now, like I'm saying, I taught at the University of Iowa last semester in their sports management program, mm -hmm. and I had three varsity athletes in my class. Okay. They love Gary Barta. He's a great <laughs> AD. They love the program he's putting together. Yeah. The only complaint they had was that in the meal plans, the guacamole was not chunky. Right. Yeah, so, that's a problem. You know, I mean, there comes a time we all need to, you know, just dig deep, cowboy up, and realize nobody's going to make guacamole like our mother. But what's the meal plan like for an athlete at UAB? <laughs> we have, uh, as I mentioned, the nutrition stations uh, that we put in, and we've we've partnered with our uh, Department of Health Sciences, and they uh, pro are providing nutritionists for us, which really make a, a huge difference for us. And it's an education, right? What's the right thing to put in? And we have great cafeterias here at UAB, and so the meal plans are terrific. And and we're educating them on what's the right thing, whether they need to gain weight or lose weight or, or, or just be leaner, whatever that might be, and uh, the things that can help them. Yeah, we, we, we do a lot there, and we're proud of it. Now, Heather, like she also pointed out that at Pitt, it was fantastic having their medical school there. You know, they're, mm. they're great for health facilities, too, just like yeah. UAB. And she said they did a lot of studies utilizing the athletes. Do you have sort of that cross-pollination here with the UAB athletes in the medical facilities? We sure do. Probably the best one is uh, through concussion protocols in our school of optometry. Uh, we have, uh, they, they've partnered with us and uh, they'll take our student athletes who uh, have concussions and they have a, a spinning chair that helps with concussions and um, uh, it's really fascinating work, uh, well above my head, but we have that s uh, similar to Pitt. We have a similar relationship here at UAB and, you know, if, if you need an MRI, we don't make an appointment and three days later go down, you know, across town. We we, if you need an MRI, we go on a golf cart two blocks away and they're in right now. And, you know, that's huge. And the ability to diagnose problems quickly and, and get treatment um, immediately is, is certainly a positive. You know, when you look at what the UAB athletes get, you know, the food, the nutrition, the superior education, you understand why Lenny Elmore, the former All-American basketball player, NBA player, and ESPN yeah. commentator said today the athletes receive extraordinary benefits. What is, what's better now than when you were playing at Tennessee? I think they're extraordinary. I think the recognition of all the health needs that we have different than before, uh, including mental health, you know, it's, it's real. And um, the, the protocols we put in place, you, met, you asked me about Title IX and the education that we do for sexual assault. So we had, a, um, we had a, a seminar the other day, you are what you tweet. You know, I didn't have to deal with, with that. I didn't have a cell phone uh, when I was in college. They didn't exist. I didn't have, the internet did not exist. So these are things that I wasn't worried about, someone videotaping my entire life. And every single thing that I said didn't end up on the internet for the entire world to see. And, and I'm grateful for that, you know, in a lot of ways. But uh, those are challenges that student athletes have that most of us didn't have. And so we put a lot of things in place to help uh, do continuing education, again, outside the classroom, leadership education that, that didn't exist before. Um, you know, but, but the, the number of people that are there and ready to help you medically mm -hmm. and academically is far superior, far superior to what I had when I was in school. You know, it's interesting you mentioned mental health. Dr. Kraft, the AD at Temple, they've just hired a first full-time mental health professional, mm -hmm. and he says they're not here to help you make that putt. You know, he said, you know, he played linebacker in Indiana. He was a Big right. Ten football player. Number 47 in your program, yeah, and he number said, one in your heart. Number one in your heart, and he said that... Uh, <laughs> You know, it's tough for an athlete to admit that they're feeling any pain mm -hmm. whatsoever, male or female. I mean, how are you guys breaking down with that, with the mental health, so that they come to you to prevent tragedies? So he and I are well aligned there, and I was at Temple prior to here, and, and Pat and I are good friends, and, and so I'm, I'm familiar with uh, his feelings on the matter. And did you become an Eagles fan while you were working? I did, yeah, I did become how an Eagles convenient. fan. How convenient, right. <laughs> My kids are probably bigger fans than I am, but it was fun, right. Um, but, you know, I think... Um, you know, I mentioned sexual assaults a minute ago. Some people think that there are more, more assaults than ever before. I disagree with that. I think what we've done is we've empowered young women to, to speak up and say, this happened and it was not okay. I don't know that there are more. I think there are more cases. I think there are more reports. And so in a similar way, mental health, we have continued to say, there's a lot of us that have anxiety. There are a lot of us that get depressed. A lot of us get homesick. Let us help you. And we talk about it. I think we're, we're more open about it. And I think that, that discussion helps foster a comfort level to know 
there are people here in place at our institution that want to help you and are happy to help you. And uh, yeah, we, we break down a lot of mm -hmm. we break down a lot of barriers that way. Do the students realize that you know, helping them with the mental health to overcome depression will not only help them perform as an athlete, but also in the classroom and then later on in life? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and those who, who receive the care, they know that. So let me ask you a question. I was reading a book about a detective who said, you know, you need three pieces of evidence to solve a crime. You might get lucky, do it with two, it's never <laughs> one. What three things do you look for in hiring? You know, I, we just started a, an assistant coaches academy uh, here last semester and we're teaching our, we get all of our assistant coaches together, which is a, a unique group that doesn't get pulled together very often. And last semester we spent a lot of time talking about what makes a great assistant coach. This semester we've talked about, so you want to be a head coach. You know, how do you take that next step from being the associate head coach to becoming a head coach? So in our last, uh, last meeting, which was three weeks ago, I said, I talked about this and I said the number one thing that we look for is integrity. Now, that sounds really nice and my president loves hearing it and people like that. And it's one of those things that you go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But it really is true and here's why. If you start with integrity, uh, if the head coach is a person of high character and integrity, they're going to hire assistant coaches who are like-minded. So from the beginning, your, your infractions are going to be reduced significantly. They're not going to cheat intentionally. If they make a mistake, they make a mistake and we all do and you move on but they're not going to do that uh, with any malice or intent. Uh, next, they're going to recruit student athletes who are similar to them, Certainly. right? So they're not going to go try to find a bunch of renegades who don't care about school. And so ultimately those student athletes are going to be better in the classroom and have fewer off the field troubles. So when you start with that one person at the head coach position that has a high level of integrity and character, it filters down through that entire team and ultimately produces a lot of other good results and you can eliminate problems before they occur. So I would say number one is integrity. Uh, you know, you're looking for a person who, let's say it's the sport of basketball, has as they call a high basketball IQ, right? You want a person who's organized and uh, a great recruiter, a proven track record of recruiting. Those are important things. You, you, you have to have players. At the end of the day, you have to have great players who are well coached uh, to win. Um, but a big thing for me is energy. You know, you're not going to come sleep through an interview and get the job here. Um, I want somebody who shows up to work and they walk to their office door and they kick it in. I, I, I'm not interested in somebody who's just sort of calling it a day and showing up late and leaving early and just trying to get through it. You know, treats every day like it's Monday. Yeah, you know, Monday, I'm excited about Monday. I can't wait to get to Monday. That's a good day. But a lot of people, unfortunately, view that as a uh, a sad day that they don't want to go. That's not who I'm looking for. I want somebody who approaches their job with enthusiasm. So how do you gauge that energy, that enthusiasm, that passion? You know, the first one, integrity. You know, you can see that, no recruiting violations, no other mm -hmm. things like that. Second one, you know, commitment, knows the game, stuff like that, under high basketball IQ. You can see that by the record mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But how do you judge that energy, that enthusiasm, that passion for not only the game, but for the student athletes and for the university? Yeah, you know, I'd say, so the, the win-loss record kind of speaks for itself. You know, you can see somebody's track record of success pretty easily, as you indicated. I think when you're talking to them, you can just feel their energy level when you're talking. You can, you can see it in the way that they express themselves and uh, how they talk about their excitement. And I don't really, I don't want a, a person who just wants to be a head coach. I want somebody that wants to be the head coach here. And, and their ability to express that is important to us. And, and the coaches that we've hired have been able to do that. They've been expressed. Oh, no, I, I'm not just trying to be a head coach. No, no, no. I want to be the head coach at UAB, and here's why. And I have a plan. Say? Well, I have a plan. I have a recruiting plan. You know, here's where we're going to go get players, and I know that we can win. And, and they have confidence in their ability to come here and be successful. And, and we tell them, we're going to do everything we can to support you, and we're going to put you in a position to have that kind of success. The integrity question, really, uh, it's not the hardest to see, but uh, we, we get pretty deep in terms of the people that we ask. We'll call your equipment managers, we'll call the trainers at the, your place, but not just the people on your reference list. You definitely the, do you do that. Well, sure, but those are the people, you know, I'll, I've been known to ask people, you know, who empties the wastebasket in your office? Tell me what that person's name is. And I want to know, do they know who that is? Definitely no big stars or overinflated egos, huh? Yeah, Miss Wanda does it here, and I appreciate her. She comes in every morning at 5 a.m., and she's wiping down the windowsills, and she's cleaning the wastebaskets and, and the bathrooms. She puts in a lot of hard work to help us look good when we get here, you know, and that's important to me. And I think it's important that 
people recognize that. And so, yeah, we're asking a lot of questions when we interview people. And, you know, speaking of big stars, let's wrap it up with going a little old school with Cool and the Gang, Hollywood Swing. In the CBS article, you said when Hollywood makes a movie about last season, <laughs> right. Brad Pitt's going to play Bill Clark. Right. And George Clooney's going to play you. So yeah. let's end up with two questions. Yeah. Number one, was that your picking or you guys' wives picking those <laughs> stars? And number two, are we talking uh, George Clooney, ER, Doug Ross, 1994? Maybe. Or George Clooney, Maybe. 2017, Maybe. Suburbia? Maybe. I don't know if George was an offensive lineman at every point, any point in his life, but he's going to have to beef up a little bit probably to get it right. Um, yeah, we, we actually used that. It was a bit of a running joke in recruiting. Um, when we first started this out, you just have to take yourself back, and we can show you the football facility, what we were in before. And we had a piece of paper, a printout from my computer, is what Coach Clark and his staff were using when recruiting to say, we're going to raise money for this thing. And it didn't look anything like the building looks like today, okay? No, not at all. And, and we said, you just have to trust us. And then we would get kids here on campus who were on official visit and, you know, just to try to lighten the moment to say, you need to start thinking about who's going to play your part in the movie. Yeah. Coach Clark is already lobbying for Brad Pitt, and if so, I'm getting George Clooney. Yes, you guys know, you know. your wives, huh? Did well, they, they were all in. They're, they're all in, too. They're they, very supportive. Yeah, very supportive of that. Yeah, I don't Count know if they agree with it. tickets for that movie. Perfect. You, you can to come it. to the premiere. I look forward. <laughs> it's Jonathan Yates, University of Alabama at Birmingham. Stay classy, Blazer Nation. Thank you. <laughs>